Hello and welcome to part one of two of the introduction to the Spanish Armada. And well, I'm going to start off by making a slightly unusual plug for me. Usually I leave it to the end to go, can you please like and subscribe if you like these videos and want to keep them coming. But I'm going to start doing this at the beginning. And there, I have a reason for this. Technically, I am now unemployed. I say this technically. Because the universities I work for, I'm a contract lecturer, so I'm on a 10-month yearly contract. So despite that contract being renewed pretty much every year in October, it has this happen every year as well. So currently, technically, unemployed. And of course, usually, in the summer, as I've said before, I go off and do summer schools for a, com a company called Justin Craig, which is brilliant fun. For and honestly, um, more than bridges the gap and provide in terms of income and provides me with enough money to do my research trips normally. But that's not running this year. <laughs> they've gone online and they're still offering the same great tuition. And I'm not being paid by them at all, so I can say this completely unbiased. It's not paid for promotion or anything. Justin Craig have some absolutely amazing tutors in that. So if you are needing help, please go look into them. But GCSEs, A levels, I think they're also doing. Can you say trees now? Um, but that means technically, until the book starts, hopefully producing some money. Um, which is going to be once it's all finalized and through, and it is all with the publishers now, so. and all they seem to be happier now. He's crossing fingers. Then YouTube and my extension Patron are my only sources of income. They're my finances. Now I have stock money so don't think i'm going to be in penury and i do have the great fortune to live at home and have a mum who had declared a few years ago that as she had paid off all the mortgage as long as we contribute towards the bills uh she's not demanding rent off her children which is another reason why considering the london house price market i've been staying at home to try and build up my money Basically, one of the interesting things in the UK is if you live near London and still live at home in your 30s, people just go, it's London, it's the house prices, we understand. And also, thanks to having universities employ me for 10 months and then not employ me, it makes getting a mortgage kind of difficult and also getting, it's going to sound like rented accommodation occasionally difficult, unless it's quite expensive, which won't allow you to build up the money to get the deposit for a mortgage eventually. But anyway, that all means that, really, I have to start treating um, YouTube as my primary income source for the next couple of months, at least. In which case, I really should start sort of more professionalizing it. Well, not sort of professionalizing, but emphasizing the things like liking and sharing, because apparently they boost the income. And it will be quite nice. Because, basically, I have got the budget for everything apart from books for the next couple of months. And you all know how I love books. So, Super Chats, um, Patron, all advertising income from this will be going pretty much on book supplies. So, thank you to everyone who does subscribe. Thank you to everyone who does like. And thank you to everyone who does share. Um, I do like it being shared on Twitter, mainly because... There are some colleagues who have told me that doing this isn't worthwhile and I should just be concentrating on doing journal articles. To which my spot response that I've got three art journal articles going through the review. I have two more written and I am not putting those in till the other three have actually got to the point where they are somewhere near publishing because I am fed up. One of those chapters, uh, one of those journal articles has actually been going through the process of review for three and a half, possibly four years. Before anyone starts thinking this is chronic revisions on my part, I'm not terrible. Um, 
actually it was almost through to the point of publication and then the journal it was with stopped functioning and didn't publish so i had to start the process all over again in another journal and that was the same journal because i built a such relationship the second article was with as well so that also had to go back to the beginning and then i got the third article done and the fourth article so i put some into the third article so that's in the process but it's just it, it takes time to go through reviews and to get published because there are so many articles produced in history so um yeah that's the fun. So, back to today's topic. Just please like and share. It'd be really nice. And subscribe. The outcome of the 1588 Spanish Armada. Strategy, technology, tactics, or luck. Now, I am going to be shooting down a couple of myths here. Because going back to the sort of the uh, mentioning of Justin Craig earlier, um, my usual son of employers, they teach GCC in A level history. And some of the GCC history sites I see about the Spanish Armada are possibly some of the worst history I've seen. There is a lot of stuff which is correct, but there is a lot of stuff which has been abridged to make the topic more manageable for the GCC students, apparently. And this... I have to admit, whenever I teach it, I tend to teach them up rather than trying it. And I know most GCC history teachers do, because I think the fault is with the actual shaping of the expectations of the GCC history board rather than the teachers. The teachers, GCC history teachers I know, frankly excellent historians. Every single one. So they could teach it. And I think the students would enjoy the history far more if they were taught it to that level of detail. Because often the things wrong aren't so much wrong as they're missing out on lots of the nuance and the detail. So this is going to be full of nuance and detail, which I wish was in the GCC. And I wish there was an A-level course. And this is what I would teach at the university if I was talking, teaching about Spanish Armada. Bill Trump's. Now. Michael Clapp episode is live. Episode 9, parts 1 and 2 are live. And... I'm not going to say this because it sounds too much like bragging, but I will say it. I think it might be the most popular episode we've done yet. It's very, very fun and it's very, very cool. And it's come with this great saying, which I'm now using the new um, version of Rochambeau or Rock, Paper, Scissors. is isn't Rock, Paper, Scissors anymore. It's Rock, Paper, Exocet. Because what defeats Exocet? Rock! Go listen to it, you'll find out why where that comes from. So the contents of the Spanish Armada. You have so much weird stuff going on. Um, I'm not even going to get into Edward because frankly, that poor boy is... He tried the best for a very young boy. Henry VIII... Well, if you want a good book on Henry VIII... I have two absolutely excellent books on him. Um, this one, which is Henry VIII by J.J. Iscaris' book. And this one, which is by my old professor, Professor Glenn Rich and Renaissance Monarchy. The Reigns of Henry VIII, Francis I, and Charles V. This book actually prof uh, richardson wrote an entire module around and made us all buy and i'm forever grateful for them from doing that because it's an absolutely brilliant book and if you're interested in these kings if you're interested in what they're doing these two books are absolutely exceptional in terms of giving you the history now you have to remember there is, though, a wider world going on. So we talk about all the things going on in England as if that is what's going on. 
Queen Mary, the fight between Catholicism, and then the yeah, murder happens. It's not quite so neat. For starters, you have the Treaty of Tordesillas, which divides the New World, or South America, uh, between Portugal and Spain. It's endorsed by the Pope. Now, the English are already annoying while they're Catholic in terms of wandering down to the, uh, to the New Empire and the New World. And the Spanish are already worrying about them enough while they're Catholic. Once they are no longer Catholic, once they are no longer in, uh, under the... Um, oh, how do I put this politely? Uh, to use the phrase as described at the time, the yoke of the Pope. I'm not quite sure I agree with that phrase, but it does work quite well. They are suddenly free to do what they like. They have no... Pro they, uh, you can't appeal to a higher power when the country you're fighting is outside of the Catholic umbrella. You have no higher power. Your only option is force. Because they're going to do what they want. And England has to invest in a navy. Invest in a navy. England, ugh, this is going to sound so trite, but it's so true at the same time. England is an island nation. Its moat is the ocean around it, is the seas around it. If it can control that moat, it has a chance of survival. That's its strength. Spain has to have an army. It's part of the Habsburg Empire, which is pretty much fighting the Ottomans non-stop. It is also dealing with issues in Netherlands versus Protestants, Germany versus Protestants. Um, and it's got its own internal fun with the Moriscos, who are the less, uh, leftovers of the Moroccan empires of Spain. And they run most of the economy. And basically, the Spanish are kicking them out, which is sending the Spanish economy into the drain. And so they're dependent upon the money coming from the New World to keep their economy going, which is why Philip II and his father before him liked to default on loans. And they also have a system whereby the monarchy, the Roth and the monarchy can default on loans. And uh, you can't enforce getting your money back off them because they have an army and will use it. Just ask the Nevers. Spain is really a nightmare to run, though. Not only is it economically in the pits, really, at this time, um, it is a myriad of different kingdoms with their own assemblies, and their own bureaucracies, and their own appointments, and... <sighs> Honestly, for a king, a foreign policy must be a dream because dealing with domestic policy in Spain is a nightmare. Think the American federal system, but without the Supreme Court or the army or anything else, really. Um, it's just, it's, uh, it's a mess. In fact, the, the new British federal system could be heading that way, but no, it's, it's, uh, that's actually still better. Um, yeah, the, the the Spanish one is just the... Anyway, so, there is a tit-for-tat escalation going on with England, with Queen Elizabeth. Um, basically, she doesn't want to get married to Philip II. She considers him an annoying piece of... Mm, and he is her sister's widow. Plus, her sister had been... Not, I think, Elizabeth's favourite person after locking her up quite so often and threatening to kill her quite so often. Um, but the thing is, Elizabeth does kill more than uh, Mary does. <laughs> Don't get, let's go to that. Mary really doesn't kill as many as Elizabeth does. But the thing is, Elizabeth always has reasons which can be substantiated beyond you disagree with me on religion. She always makes sure she has reasons that can be stumped or sometimes she to be on that. So she doesn't appear to persecute people for what's in their hearts. She persecutes them for things they've actually done. It's a slightly higher burden of proof. We're not quite sure if there's always actually legitimate proof. But there is enough it stops her getting the title Bloody Elizabeth. Or Executioning Elizabeth. And so instead, she becomes Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, the great, amazing founding queen of, you know, the dynasty. 
a dynasty which ceases to exist when she dies. Anyway. Um... And then there's the trouble with his own uh, Philip II of Spain's running of Spain, because you have the fact that it might be him who's ordering the support of the plots. But as we'll get against Elizabeth, but as we'll get into later, he doesn't always have that much control of what's going on in his own court. Yeah, that's a bit of a problem. Anyway. And... She responds to these mm, machinations by sending an army to the Netherlands. Unfortunately, also her own one of her own favourites, uh, Robert Dudley Earl of Leicester, decides to take the governor generalship of um, the Netherlands, which annoys her because she tells him not to because it binds her hands, and she lets Drake and others loose on the Spanish possessions. They'd already been heading down there anyway, and she'd probably been sponsoring quite a few of them. But, you know, it doesn't happen every time. So, this now gets us into the people, and we're going to start with the Spanish. Now, the original commander, the proposer, the originator, the only one who possibly could have made it even tangentially work is um, Alvaro de Bazen, or first Marquis of Santa Cruz. He's basically the Spanish equivalent of Howard of Effingham. He is a second generation military commander. He has served under his father. He has grown up. He's developed. He, he, he is pretty much one of the critical people for Spain in terms of their naval wars. He's the one who gives them victories in the Azores and helps out at Lepanto and all sorts of things. He's also the one who gets his fleet beaten up by the Drake at Cadiz, which delays the Armada for a year. And he he has um, other issues, mainly because he has these lovely grand plans for how to do all this. But he has to deal with the next two people. And they keep delaying. So I'm going to Disappear for a second. Right. So you have the theoretical strategic command. That is Philip II of Spain. Philip II of Spain is... Um, has been ruler of Spain since he was a, pretty much 16. Um, he was left there by his father, Charles, when Charles had to go off and run elsewhere. So, you know. That's the joy of being Spain. And pretty much he takes some of his father's advice too much to heart. Especially probably the religious stuff and trusting in God. But there again, trusting in God had managed to get the most of South America. Because let's be honest, if there had, there, South America was taken on a wing of a prayer. But the other issue that they're trying to coordinate with is the commander in Netherlands. Alexander Farsi, the Duke of Parma, who runs his pretty much his own distinct foreign policy and military policy from the Netherlands. He just expects Philip to pay the bills, um, which is really rather annoying for Philip on many occasions because he's trying to coordinate things and Parma is off doing his completely own thing. Anyway, unfortunately, Santa Cruz dies. And that's a problem, because who can you replace Santa Cruz with? Now, why is that a problem? Because Santa Cruz is more than just a military commander. He is a noble, and he's won several victories. So, therefore, he's been ennobled. Well, not enough time. Um, he can do the things he needs to do to command. What is an expedition which is kind of top-heavy in terms of its nobles, who are mostly all keen that they should be in charge and should have the glory of taking um, 
England, but don't actually want to do the problematic stuff of actually dealing with it all. And Santa Cruz could be in charge because he'd won victories. Um, but now Philip II of Spain needed another commander. He needed a commander who everyone would have to accept and could actually work. So he goes for his most senior nobleman available. Um, Alonso Perez de Gagnon is Santomeo, the seventh Duke of Medina Sidonia. Sorry, I should really have had my notes out for that one, but I thought the screen would be big enough. He is not a sailor. He has never commanded a fleet in action, and this is going to be a major fleet amphibious operation. This is the Falklands. Not quite the same distance, but a whole lot more difficult. This is Quebec. This is all sorts of things. And as his deputy commander, he has Jan Martinez at their record. Now, the actual thing is, Juan Martinez is technically should have probably been the actual person put in charge after Santa Cruz died, but didn't have any ranks in there. Isn't noble. Um, that's the problem. So, poor Sidonia, Medina Sidonia has the job. And there is a big problem, because Medina Sidonia, whilst he's not actually the best sailor in the world, is actually very good at logistics, and he has been a soldier. So he starts about organizing things, and he gets them organized, and he starts doing, trying to do consensual leadership, um, and all these sort of things, getting people to buy in, and a group discussions, and working things out that way. But he also sends notes back to Philip Spain, basically going, I don't think this is actually possible. We are not communicating well. I don't know where I'm supposed to be putting my ships to store them till Palmer arrives. Oh, they'll be waiting for you. And they they weren't, of course. But what it also means is that the trouble is his messages aren't getting through. Are getting changed and edited by courtiers. So the phraseology which Philip is seeing is, it's all good, go ahead. None of the problems. Problems were mostly caused by the fact that he ran out of funds in several years, and so that's why the Armada couldn't get launched. And also, that explain it, the fact is that many of the critical, really biggest, most powerful ships in the fleet were, of course, had to go off for the treasure fleet, which was critical to his economy. Which leads to an interesting point later on. So, the English people. And I know I'm the sort of looking at the senior people over here, but there's actually a slightly more complicated scenario going on with the English. Why? Well, it happens closer to the UK. So, it happens closer to England. And that means far more senior officers can get involved. Once you're beyond a certain distance from community from home, it cut, shuts down the number of people who are involved. When you're in the UK, when you're on top of your na national doorstep, a lot more people get involved. For example, you have First Earl of Leicester is in charge of the militia. They get formed up at Tilsbury. We'll get into the militia in a bit. That's the armed force, the ground force command. That's the equivalent of Palmer, really. And he had fought Palmer, done quite well in the Netherlands. So, um, you know, uh, the principal secretary or spymaster, Sir Francis Walsingham. Let's try. He is. How to put it? Critically involved in that, what is he planting around? Um, letters get intercepted by Spanish intelligence, which show that he is telling, trying to get the Ottomans to attack Habsburg territories and Spanish territories to um, distract them. 
This may or may not be true, but the fact is it does make the Spanish slightly watching of their rear. Um, Elizabeth I has also uh, agreed a trade deal, etc., with the Moroccan caliphate sort of thing going on down there. So, um, yeah, she's quite and she and she's causing all sorts of fun, thanks to pretty much William Cecil, who's her Secretary of State and Lord High Treasurer at this point. Basically, he's her Prime Minister. That is how we would think of him in modern things. That's the role he thinks. And in many ways, um, Principal Secretary, Sir Francis Walsingham, is her Foreign Minister. That is, if you're looking at how they're sort of rolled and carrying out, that's it. And... Well, you have an interesting thing going on here. And once you get onto the Navy, you have Drake, who is pretty much the at-sea operational commander who's being sent out on missions, however officially, unofficially. Nothing much gets about the Queen's backing, and she does provide a lot of financial support and ships to quite a lot of his operations, so that's involved. But he's only Vice Admiral. You have... The Lord High Admiral, or First Sea Lord equivalent, at this time, um, is Lord Howard of Effingham, who will actually also take it for his fleet to sea and command it. And you have Rear Admiral and Treasurer and of the Navy, and arguably its controller as well, um, John Hawkins, who is critical to designing the ships, who is going to be third in command. So, for your fleet, of which one of them is the guy who's been in charge of building stuff, the other one's been in charge of the ground strategy and organising things, and one's been going off fighting the Spanish and learning their weaknesses. And you also have the Queen. Now, the interesting thing with Elizabeth is she only really has one parliament to deal with. But she does have many other organisations she has to manage, and she does it quite well. Because of Mary had mismanaged it, and especially Mary had brought in Philip, and the attachments of Philip being attached with it, and the way Elizabeth managed a reformation, which was very much Henry the Eighth, uh, Henry the Eighth's sort of aims, but with Henry the Seventh's style of management. I, her granddad, so it was far more, um, at least on the surface, conciliatory and, you know, friendly. Underneath, just as deadly, but, you know, done in a slightly different way. She had managed to get quite a secure position at home. She managed to get rid of a lot of her threats, which meant that she could be quite secure with large numbers of troops being formed, and she didn't have to worry about the Scots, even though she had executed Mary, Queen of Scots. Um, Mary wasn't actually this time quite that popular in Scotland. She's more popular now, but at the time, honestly, whilst James would have probably preferred his mum not to be executed, he did kind of understand the joy of dealing with her plotting, at least many of his ministers did. And she did, was a sort of, even if she wasn't actively involved in the plots, she did attract them like a moth to a flame. <sighs> when people tell you that history is e simpler than today, they're just wrong, okay? It's just as complicated, and people are just as weird. So, here are the forces deployed. I bet I've just shocked you. So, um, Spanish force, 130 ships, including 20 galleons, 4 galleys, 4 galleases, uh, made up of mostly Urca, or supply hulks, caracks, caravels, and other small craft. 8,000 sailors, 18,000 soldiers, carrying 1,500 brass guns and 1,000 iron guns. They're supposed to meet up with the Army of Netherlands, including another 30,000 troops. But remember, they are fighting in the Netherlands. 
So every time someone says they had 30,000 troops, they'd bring them all with them. I sit there and go, really? Duke of would probably come. He'd quite enjoy it. But I have a feeling he would probably bring 18,000 at maximum. So we're probably looking at an army of 36,000 at maximum. I'm reckoning probably around 30,000. He'd bring 12,000 of his experienced troops from the Netherlands. Um, enough to make sure that he had command and firm command of the army because he, like Medina Sidonia, knew exactly what he was going to be dealing with. Bay of Biscay and certain actions of the English in the Bay of Biscay, Bay of Biscay combined with storms meant that six ships, including at least six ships, it could be more, including one galleon and four and the four galleys, all fell back. So now 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 19 galleons. Right, it's an English force. A fleet of 197 ships, including 21 galleons of the Royal Fleet, and a further 30 galleon-sized vessels, at least 12 which were privateers owned by the fleet commanders. So theoretically, 51 galleon equivalent vessels available. The Royal Fleet has 34 ships, 21 of them are galleons. Um, so, you know, English don't appear to be outnumbered here. The thing is, the English overall do carry less guns, but we'll get into that. Um, probably half number of guns is what I put. There are some people who put them as estimate. They go, only 200 guns in the um, English force and thousands of guns in the Spanish force. So I go, well, if you're counting every single gun, the Spanish ship has a gun, but you're only counting the heaviest guns that the English ships are carrying, then it's going to look like that. But not all the Spanish guns were massive and... The English guns, not that, whilst the bigger, whilst they might not have all been as big, work. You've got sixty pounders. You've got all sorts of different pounders. They were still quite viable weapons at this point. Later, compared to the, I don't know, HMS Victory, not very viable. But at the time, they were fine, especially for anti-personnel work and the ranges they're getting involved engaging at. So, here's the other big thing I want to disabuse people of. So, we have the militia at Tilsbury is a force of 4,000 to prevent advance up the Thames Estuary. They are not the field army which is going to engage the Duke of Palmer's troops if they land. If the Duke of Palmer lands, that army will swell quite quickly. How will it swell? Well, you have trained bands. That's what the militia are known as. And Okay, they are kind of, I suppose you could call them like the National Guard and the, US Armed For and the US Armed Forces. And like the National Guard, there is a vagrance in their capabilities in that some National Guards are considered really, really high-end combat troops and some are far but are still pretty good combat troops. Well, in this case... People always go, well, you know, uh, it, it depends on the local leadership and it depends on the local lord and etc. how good they are and what reasons they have for it. And I go, yes, it does. So maybe in the centre of the UK, the central counties, they're not that great. But the ones in Wales and on the Welsh borders have to deal with issues quite regularly and the militia is their local police force as well as their army, so they're going to keep them quite well trained. The ones in the north, centred on York, but other cities as well, um, have to deal with the Scottish occasionally coming and raining, so guess what? <laughs> they're quite well trained and quite large. York is usually the largest band of trained troops. Um, they're often up to, seem to be around about 12,000. There are other figures, they do, it does go up and down, and trying to find out the exact figures at the time has proved interesting, but I'd say roughly they're not. 
London is second largest number of train bands and train troops, and they are kept very, very well trained. They are paid for by the livery companies. There is a current descendant of them, the 21st Artisans Regiment, which is the reserve SAS in the UK. That is a descendant of the trained bands. We're talking the same troops who the War of the Four Kingdoms, the what is also sometimes called as the English Civil War, um, made sure no fighting descended upon London, because every time any side brought an army close to London, the trained bands would be massed and would go, are you going to sack the going to keep yourselves peaceful? They were strong enough, efficient enough at that time that even the new model army didn't want to tangle them. They were very much professional soldiers. They were... In, how do I put this? When I say professional soldiers, they're professional soldiers by the standards of time, in that most of their NCOs and officers had actually been were combat veterans. And they did a lot of training, and they were of London oversaw them. They paid taxes, contributions to support them. Trust me, they wanted their they wanted their financial value for money, and they made sure they were well equipped. You also have the southern ports, which have had issues with raids by Barbary uh, Barbary pirates in taking people for slavery. Um, you've had the schism from Rome by Henry VIII and all the forts he's built along the coast. This has meant that a large, these organ, most of the south coast of the UK of England has quite well trained, quite well organised bands of soldiery to call upon. So, whilst yes, they have only four thousand, and they're probably going to be slightly short in terms of field artillery versus the latter, the Spanish. I wouldn't be surprised if the English force could have put an equivalent fighting force of about 30,000 into the field if the Spanish had actually invaded. It wouldn't have happened immediately. It would have been about a week or two weeks. But how quickly would the Spanish get all 30,000 troops to fought ashore and organized naval and they wouldn't be able to do a quick landing and advance straight up to London because there's the four thousand at Tilsbury and then above, behind that will be the train bands formed there, forming up from London. So there will be a quite a significant force in their way which won't want to move. Now you can sit there and go, but the Duke of Palmer's army has been fighting in the Netherlands for the last few years. Yes, but so have all the veterans who are now providing the officers, the NCOs, in these forces. And they're going to be defending their homes. And the other motivation for them is they don't want to be having to pay forced loans to the king, which he's never going to pay back. That's the motivation for the livery companies. They also, quite a lot of the English people, do not want to return to the system under Mary. That's Elizabeth's elder sister. In that, whilst fair number, that didn't mean they necessarily wanted to have a scenario which had been an, under the previous one. They didn't want it imposed by foreign rule. And this meant that it was a far more solid mixture. You also noticed something when I was talking about the commanders. If I go back to the English commanders. Right then, so we have the first Earl of Leicester. Then we have Sir Francis Walsingham. No real title going on there. Uh, William Cecil, first Baron Burley. I think he was made that. I'm never quite sure how soon he was made that. We have Howard of Effingham, who is, as I said, second generation military commander experienced naval officer. He's the first eagle. Then Sir Francis Drake, knight, and Sir John Hawkins, knight. Sounds to me like, yes, the Armada and Duke of Palmer is certainly a professional 
soldier, very good. And Medina Sidonia is a very, probably a very efficient soldier as well. And frankly, with his 18,000 troops, could probably have done a fairly decent job. But he has an army commander with him. He's there to command the fleet. The thing is, the Royal Navy, uh, the British, the English, sorry, have managed to put together quite an efficient command structure of quite experienced people. And they haven't come from nowhere. So, the Spanish strategy, and this is where this part one ends. Sail to Netherlands, link up with the Duke of Parma's army, escort combined forces across the channel, land either in Thames Estuary or South Coast, conquer at least Curb Elizabeth's power, and there are some st links to the state paper down below, which I found really cool reading. Um, English strategy is by hook or by crook to stop the Spanish succeeding, preferably stop them landing in the first place. Accomplish this by keeping them moving. The army can't cross without the fleet. The fleet can't join up with the army without a lot of coordination. If they can be kept moving, that will be prevented. Now, the amount of people who have said over the past in the Armada that the English don't have a strategy. They do. And the fleet would be nice. They would love to destroy the Spanish fleet. That would be a great victory they'd be really happy with. But driving the Spanish forward and keep driving them and driving them away and up and way and up and into the bad seas of the North Atlantic. That's a mission kill. That is what they are after. And they're quite happy with that. A mission kill will do. So, today is the outcome of the Spanish Armada. Strategy, technology, tactics, and luck. Now we've done the background. The part two will focus more in on the technology, tactics, and luck. This was the strategy section. Um, then it's Tuesday length, Battle of Cape Pissarro. Thursday the 13th. HMS Emerald and Enterprise. In video four, courtesy of Daniel Freeman. What if the Singtar incident goes hot? Hopefully recording those the introductory videos today soon. Um, Thursday 20th, Battle of Texiel, 25th, could Crete have been saved in 1941, the Convoy War and the Perfect Storm of PQ-17, Monday the 31st, Patreon Video 5, courtesy of Bail Nora, Metrain and Gunboat Diplomacy in the Victoria now. Gonna expand on that a bit, anyway. Twitter, AC underscore Naval History, Patron, AC Naval History, and Global Maritime History. That's where I am. Thank you if you go looking. Hope you enjoyed this. And thank you again. As I said, if you like, please do like it. If you would like to subscribe to get more of these videos, please do. And please share. Because as I said at the beginning, for the next couple of months, this is really my income. Which is funny. I never really thought about this when it started. I was just thinking this was a nice way to spend my time when I wasn't writing a book or dealing with students online, and it was a fun way if I was going to be trapped in my room due to shielding and being the one who goes in and out of my uh, house for my family, that it would be a nice way to spend some time doing some great history. And now it's this. So, thank you. That's all being down to you. So thank you very much to my patrons, and thank you very much to my subscribers and viewers. Thank you all, and take care.